Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning session. I am Fabrizio Riguzzi, one of the organizers of uh, the school and of the Ray event. And uh, I am uh, associate professor here at the University of Ferrara. And uh, my main research uh, area is uh, probabilistic inductive logic programming. And uh, so I, I work on developing learning system for uh, probabilistic logic programming. So in this talk, I will uh, discuss uh, some systems for inducing logic programs, in particular probabilistic logic programs. So I will first uh, briefly recap what probabilistic logic programming is, and then I will present some system for parameter learning and for structure learning. Finally, I will conclude with some um, uh, ongoing work on uh, uh, combining deep learning with probabilistic logic programming. So most of the material in this talk is uh, included in this book that is uh, due to be published in a few days. So you can, there are leaflets downstairs uh, on the table next to the entrance if you want to, to pick one and just to have the coordinates of the book. So let's uh, briefly recap what probabilistic logic programming is. So we will consider uh, a specific instance, which uh, is the one based on the distribution semantics, because it's uh, uh, the one that is uh, used most often and uh, is one of the most intuitive, OK? And uh, the semantics of a probabilistic logic program can be given in uh, a few sentences. So a probabilistic logic program defines a probability distribution over normal logic programs. So pro logic program without probabilities that are called instances or possible words or simply words. So you have a, a distribution over these programs and they, you want to answer a query. And so you uh, consider the joint distribution of the query and the words. And from this joint distribution, you obtain the probability of the query by marginalization, by summing out the word. So this is, in three sentences, what the distribution semantics is. So there are many languages that follow the distribution semantics. And uh, the first one dates back to 91. And uh, it was developed by a Russian scientist, Danzin. And uh, already in 91, the, the way to assign a semantics to probabilistic logic program was the one uh, I showed you before. Uh, the name distribution semantic was given by Sato in uh, 95 for his prism language and system. But the probabilistic on abduction and the independent choice logic by David Poole uh, from 93 and 97 uh, follow the same approach for assigning a semantics to program. Then in uh, 2004, uh, logic program with annotated disjunction were proposed, which uh, uh, is uh, interesting because it has a uh, quite permissive syntax. And then problem came in uh, 2007, which uh, is uh, interesting because it is a simple possible uh, syntax extension to Prolog that uh, includes uh, uh, a probabilistic semantics. And all these languages uh, differ in the way they define the distribution of a logic programs, but uh, there are transformations between them. So you can, if you pick a program in one language, you can transform it in a program with an equivalent meaning in another language, and the transformation is polynomial. Okay, so the expressive power of these languages is the same. Okay, and the difference is only from a syntactic point of view. So uh, using one or the other is just a matter of taste. So um, nowadays, you can try uh, 
probabilistic logic programming online. There are web applications where you can uh, write programs, uh, run uh, inference, compute the probability of queries, perform also learning. And um, <coughs> so one is the CPLint that we developed here in Ferrara where you can perform inference and uh, parameter and structure learning. And the other one is a problog, uh, where you can as well perform inference and parameter learning. So, and in, in the, this afternoon, you will see uh, example of use of these uh, web applications. So let's see an example of a logic program with annotated disjunction. So this is a program that models uh, medical symptoms. And uh, the link that you can find uh, there is uh, a link to this program in the CPLint web application. So if you go to that site, you can run query against the program. So this program uh, models the occurrence of uh, sneezing, so the, the symptom of sneezing of a person given uh, is diseases. So a person X that has the flu, then he sneezes with probability 0.7, and uh, null with probability 0.3. Null means that nothing happens, so he doesn't sneeze. And if uh, she has a fever, then uh, X uh, sneezes with probability 0.8, and nothing happens with probability 0.2. And we know that Bob has the flu, and as a fever. And uh, so uh, the uh, probabilities are uh, indicated as a notation of atoms in the head of clauses. So um, um, the notation 0.7 close to the missing X means that uh, there is a probability distribution over atoms in the head. There are two atoms in the head, sneezing X and null. And these are the alternatives that can occur when the body is true. So the first is true with probability 0.7, and the second is true with probability 0.3. Uh, so the, the alternatives in the head are uh, separated by semicolon and the annotation are separated by colon. So you have distribution over the head of rules, okay? Uh, this atom null is uh, special because uh, uh, we assume that it does not appear in the body of any rule. So if null is the consequence of this body, um, there are no further inferences on, on this conclusion. And, um, and the null can often be omitted, so you can find clauses without this part, without this part, okay? So the, where the probabilities of atoms in the head do not sum up to one. And if uh, the annotation is missing, this means that the clause is certain, that is, it's not probabilistic, okay? So we know for sure that Bob has the flu and at the as a fever. So from this program you obtain words by first generating the grounding of the program by replacing variables with constants in all possible ways. In this case we have a single constant and a single variable so we get one ground clause from the first clause and one ground clause for the second. These ground clauses have uh, alternatives in the head so we generate words by picking for each clo ground clause one of the atoms in the head, okay? And uh, including in the word the uh, clause obtained in this way, which is non-probabilistic. You can assign probability to words by multiplying the probabilities of the choices made. So if you pick the first add atom for a... For a 
world and the second and the, the first atom for the second clause for the same world, the probability of the world is 0.7 times 0.8. So given these programs, uh, the reasoning tasks are free. You can perform inference. So you have a query, which is a ground atom. And um, you want to compute the probability of the query. Often you are given some evidence. So you want to compute the condition of probability of the query, given the evidence. Or you may want to perform weight learning, so you know the structure of the clauses, what atoms go in the body and what atoms go in the head. But you want to learn the parameters and you are given data uh, that uh, you want to analyze to tune the parameters. And in structural learning, you want to learn both uh, the structure, so which atom go in the body and uh, go in the head, and also the parameters. So structural learning is the task that is most uh, similar to an, an inductive logic programming task. So let's see some uh, application example. One application example is link prediction. So you have seen yesterday with Paolo an example of this data set, which is the UWCSC. So it's a data set that describes uh, a social network, the social network of professors and students of the Department of Computer Science of the University of Washington. So you want to predict when a person is connected to another person by an advice by a relation. So you want to predict the existence of an uh, advice by link between two entities, in this case two persons. Okay? So you want to predict when a person is advised by another person. And you may learn clauses such as this one, for example, that as you can see, the probability, there is a single atom in the head. Its probability is not one. This means that there is an implicit null atom that is omitted for, for brevity. And this clause states that x is advised by y with probability 0.7 if there is a publication P authored by x and the same publication is authored by y and x is a student. So x is advised by by Y if uh, they have a joint publication and X is a student, okay? Uh, so to give a meaning to this program, you have to generate the grounding. So you have to replace X, Y, and P with constant, okay? Um, and for each uh, substitution of X, Y, and P with constant, you get a ground clause which implies a choice. Okay, so what happens is that uh, uh, if uh, the x and y, if you want to predict whether uh, Bob is advised by Ellen, okay, uh, you have uh, uh, x is uh, Bob, y is Ellen, and p is uh, one of the joint publication. Suppose that you have a one joint publication, then the probability that uh, John, if, and if student X is certain and publication P of X and P of Y are certain, the probability that John, uh, Bob, is advised by Ellen is 0.7. If they share more than one publication, okay, so suppose they share two publications, okay, so you have two groundings of the clause where the body is true, and the probability that Bob is advised by Ellen is higher than 0.7, because you have two independent uh, source of evidence of the truth of the um, conclusion. Another uh, interesting application that will be discussed in more detail this afternoon by Marco is the classification of web pages on the basis of the link structure. So you want to uh, find out whether a web page is a course page or is a faculty page. Again, this is a, a data set that collects web pages of uh, members of a university department. 
So uh, you have information about the web pages from the department. You have information about the link structure, so uh, whether page two links to page one. And you know the words that appear in the pages with the predicate as. That means that page has the word syllabus in, in its text. So you may learn a program like this that states that page one is a course page with probability 0.3. If there is a link from page two to page one and page two is a course page, and uh, page one is a course page with a higher probability if there is a link from page two to page one and page two is a faculty page. So if there is a link from a page that is a faculty page, then the page is uh, more probably a course page. And then you may have um, uh, rules that relate the probability that page is, is a, a course page or a faculty page depending on the words that appear in the page. So this is an example of a collective classification problem in the sense that to classify a page you can use the classification of a related pages. So you, 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 the program computes the classification of the whole set of pages at the same time. Another uh, interesting application is entity resolution. So you want to, to identify identical entities in text of databases. One example is uh, the, a database of citations. So you, have, you collect citations from papers, and as you know, every author cites uh, papers slightly differently. Uh, so uh, you collect the text, and you have information on which word appear in the venue, in the uh, title, and in uh, the author. And you want to find out whether two uh, references point to the same paper, are the same uh, bibliographic reference. So you, you may learn the rule stating that B is the same venue. So you, for, for uh, uh, citations, for references, you can extract uh, the title, the venue, and the author. OK. So this rule, for example, states that B is the same reference as C if B has author D, C has author E, and D and E are the same author. Okay, so two references have a certain probability of uh, indicating the same paper if they have the same author. And similarly for the title and for the venue. So author uh, is a author, title, and venue are certain predicates. So given a reference, they give you um, an identifier for the author, the title, and the venue. And uh, predicates such as as word venue and as uh, word title and as word author uh, indicate which word appear in the venue, title, and author. So you can uh, learn clauses for uh, same venue. Uh, stating that B is the same venue as C if they both have the word logic and so on for all the possible words that can appear in, in venues, titles, and also then you can uh, write a rule that states that you have this B and C are the same bibliography if they have the same author as I was discussing before or the same title or the same venue. Moreover, the um, identity relation is transitive. Okay, so you can uh, compute uh, the transitive closure. So, for example, A is the same venue as B if A is the same venue as C and C is the same venue as B. And similarly for author and title, and as well for same bib. So basically, again, here you, wa you want to perform collective classification. And you want to predict whether two uh, references point to the same paper. Another domain where uh, probabilistic inductive logic programming 
has uh, been successfully applied this chemistry. So the famous mutagenesis data set, which is uh, a standard ILP uh, benchmark, and uh, probabilistic inductive logic programming was, appli was applied to mutagenesis to the mutagenesis data set as well, and uh, the results were good. So um, in this data set, you are given some uh, chemical compounds in the, uh, with, uh, with their chemical formula, and you want to classify them as active or non-active with respect to mutagenicity. So ac an active compound is one that causes mutagenesis, and an, a non-active is one that does not cause mutagenesis. Mutagenesis is a a process that can lead to cancer. So it's important to predict whether um, 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 a chemical compound is mutagenic. And uh, this uh, problem w uh, arose because the, uh, the test for mutagenicity can be performed in the lab by using an expensive procedure. So, uh, scientists wanted to have a quicker way of uh, finding out whether a compound is mutagenic or not. So what they did was they collected uh, all the experiments, the tests they have performed, where they uh, determined experimentally whether a compound was mutagenic or not, and this form a data set, and then uh, from this data set, you learn a classifier that given a new compound that still has to be tested in the lab, you predict whether it can be mutagenic. And this prediction can be used, for example, as a first approximation uh, to maybe select for lab test only those uh, compounds that uh, are more, uh, more risky, more probably mutagenic. So you have... Uh, uh, predicate at the ATM, which indicates that uh, B is a, an atom for compound A of type C means carbon, and then you have other information of the atoms. Then you have information of the bonds by the bond predicate that connects to atom B and C of compound A, and you have the type of the bound as the fourth argument. Then you have also information about uh, larger structures, such as rings of size 5, uh, carbon rings of size 6, anthracene, OK? So and, and also you have uh, the possibility of uh, uh, setting, uh, comparing uh, uh, numeric arguments with constant. You have some. Uh, attributes of the compound, such as uh, LUMO, which is a, a chemical feature of compounds, and is, a, is a, a real number that you can compare with a threshold. So you can uh, learn these programs. You can either write down what you think is a good program and learn the parameters, or you can uh, let the system infer also the structure. Again, here, this is written in LPAT syntax, but you can equivalently write it in problem syntax. And uh, it's written in LPAT syntax, but uh, there is a single atom in the head, which is common when you want to predict a single predicate. While uh, in case you want to learn a whole theory, then you may have clauses with more than one head atom. Other successful application are in medicine. So uh, P P ILP was applied to diagnose uh, liver diseases on the basis of patient information. It has been used to detect the influence of gene on HIV and for computing the risk of falling of elderly, elderly people. So now let's start with the parameter learning. And let's consider PRISM. Uh, let's see an example of a PRISM program. This PRISM program encodes a hidden Markov model. What's a hidden Markov model? A hidden Markov model is a dynamical system that, at any time point, is in uh, one state, which is taken from a 
finite set and emits one symbol again from a finite set. So the, at the next time state, time, time point, the system transitions to a new state and emits another symbol. And this uh, transition and emission are probabilistic, so you have a probability distribution of emitting a certain symbol given the state, and you have a probability distribution of the next state given the current state, okay? And it's called a Markov because the probability of the next state depends only on the current state and not on the previous state. And it's called hidden because usually when you have a system like that, you also observe only the output, the emitted symbols, and you don't know the value of the state. So with this model, you want to uh, obtain information on the states given the observation, the emitted symbols. And this, uh, the, the, the killer application of the Markov model is speech recognition, where you, the speech is the output, the emitted, uh, the emitted symbols, and you want to infer the state, which is this, the, the sentence that was uh, pronounced. So this is a PRISM program encoding a hidden Markov model. In PRISM, uh, choices are uh, encoded with the predicate MSW, which stands for uh, multi-switch. Okay. So each of these MSW atom are probabilistic atoms. So when you call one of these predicates, uh, uh, it samples uh, a value and returns it in, in the second argument. And uh, switches have a name, okay? And um, so, for example, switch out with an argument uh, as value indicated by this statement, so as value A and B. Uh, switch T, T, TR argument as value S1 and S2. So, uh, switch TR S indicates the next state where the system transition from state S. This program encodes a uh, hidden Markov model with just two states, S1 and S2, and just two output symbols, A and B. So switch TRS as value S1 and S2, and switch out as value A and B. So when you call a predicate like this, it samples a value for O, taken from A and B, and similarly for MSWTR. You can see uh, this uh, predicate as defined by probabilistic facts in Elpad style. So facts without, with, a, with an empty body, with a disjunction in the head, encoding the various alternatives. <coughs> so then you can so with the, the value predicate, you, you set, you indicate which value the predicate can take, the switch can take. And uh, with the, the directive set SW, you uh, set the parameters. So, for example, this statement states that from state S1, uh, the switch TR S1 has probability 0.2 or 0.8 meaning that from state S1, the system can go to state S2, S1 with probability 0.2, or to state S2 with probability 0.8. So the first uh, parameter is referred to the first value, and the second parameter to the second value. Um, so this sentence uh, indicates the values for all the ground association of the switch name. And here you set different parameters for the different gun instantiation. So this statement states that uh, from state S0, you have probability 0.5 of emitting A and probability 0.5 of emitting B. From state S1, you have probability 0.6 of emitting A and 0.4 of emitting B. So 
the program encoding the HMM is uh, this one. So um, the predicate HMM OS is true if OS is a list of uh, symbol emitted by the Eden Marco model, and uh, is true if from state S1 you get this list of output symbols. So the start state is S1, then you have a recursion. Um, if uh, uh, you emit no more symbols, then uh, you're done. Otherwise, you emit symbol O that is computed with this uh, predicate that uh, you can imagine as sampling a value for, for the output, okay? And then you sample a value for the next state, and then you call HMM recursively with the next state, well, this missing an S, and with the, for generating the rest of the symbol OS. So, you can do many things with this program. Let's consider a simple task where you want to compute the probability that a certain, a given sequence of symbol is emitted. So, when we speak about PRISM, we say that there is no memoing in the sense that if you have, if you encounter in the derivation for a goal the same uh, switch name, so a predicate MSW for, with the same switch name, you encounter it twice in the derivation, you sample, you, can, you, you, you do two different sampling, independent sampling, so um, which is different from LPADS and PROBLOG, where if you encounter the same probabilistic atom in the derivation, the uh, sampled value is the same, must be the same. Here, each time you encounter a MSW, you can imagine as performing an independent sampling. So, it's... Uh, um, you can, with a system that performs memoing, you can emulate no memoing by writing the program in a certain way. So. This is not a limitation of system without, with memory. So, the PRISM pro parameter learning problem is uh, this one. You are given a PRISM program P and a set of examples, which are uh, ground atoms. You want to find the parameters pi of the MSW statements so that the likelihood of the items is maximized. The likelihood of the item is simply the uh, product of the probability of each individual example. You want to maximize the probability of example. Uh, often the likelihood is uh, computed uh, um, in a logarithmic form because uh, in this way this product, uh, which is a product of many numbers all smaller than one, so going rapidly to zero, is transformed into a sum of negative numbers, because the probability are between 0 and 1, so these are all negative numbers. And uh, uh, you sum all of them, you, you will get a large negative number, but uh, it's uh, easier to, to, to manipulate than a very small um, positive uh, number. So this, this allows to avoid rounding errors with floating point arithmetic. So you want to maximize the log likelihood. And uh, you have seen yesterday inference in uh, problog, okay? So inference in problog is difficult because you have to solve the disjoint sum problem. And as Luke was saying, in PRISM you don't have this problem because you make some assumption. You assume that the probability of a conjunction is computed as the product of the probability of the independent, of the conjuncts. This is the independent end assumption. This is true if the random variables from which A depends are disjoint from the random variables for, for, on which B depends. So if A and B are independent. And the probability of a disjunction, okay, is computed as the sum of the probability of the disjuncts. 
This is ex exclusive of assumption. So if you have, uh, uh, if you can derive an atom from two different clauses, these different clauses must have mutually exclusive bodies, in, so that uh, they cannot be both true in any world. If this is true, then inference is simpler and uh, cheaper because you don't have to solve the um, uh, disjoint sum problem. So let's go back to the, our example. We want to compute the probability of a certain output sequence. Suppose you want to compute the probability of the sequence ABB, okay? To perform inference in PRISM, you have to compute explanations. What are explanations? Explanations are values for the MSW atom that uh, allow the conclusion of uh, the query. So, for example, if uh, for switch out S1 you obtain A, for switch TRS1 you obtain S1, for switch out S1 you obtain B. So, this is the sequence of values that the MSW uh, atom take, should take to conclude this goal, so the, the query, to infer the query. So, uh, this is the state, uh, so times goes on to the right, so this is start state, in start state you emit A, A. from start state S1 you remain in state S1 at time 2, and you emit B, and then you remain again in, in state S1 and you emit B, and then you remain in state S1. So, to emit three symbols, you have to perform three transitions and three emissions. Okay, so there are two states. From, a, from every state, there is a non-zero probability of going to every other state. So you have three states, um, three, uh, three states or three time points. Um, so for each time point, you have two post states. So you have eight possible sequence of states that lead to the output A, B, B. So you can express each, each possible sequence of state that generates the output with these explanations, which are sets of uh, MSW atoms. So the first explanation is the one where the system remains always in status one. In the second explanation, the system transition at time uh, three from S1 to S2, and so on. In, this, in the last uh, explanation, the starting state is always S1, but at time two, it goes in S2, at time three, again in S2, and, and uh, from the last state, it remains in S2. So you have eight explanations. In general, if the query, the query has explanation e, E1, EN, you can write these formulas. The truth of the query is equivalent to the truth of this disjunction, of the disjunction of the explanation. And because of the exclusive or assumption, okay, these explanations are all uh, indep independent, no, uh, exclusive. Okay, so you can compute the probability of the query Q by summing the probability of individual explanation because of the exclusive of assumption. And the probability of each individual explanation, each individual explanation is a set of, of MSW atom that can be interpreted as a conjunction because an explanation is a set of MSW atom that are sufficient for entailing the query. <coughs> so the probability of each explanation by the independent end assumption is given by the product of the probability of each atom. So this is allowed only because of the assumption. In Problog, it would not be possible, as well as Elpa, because you can write this formula, but these explanations are not mutually exclusive. Another example of a, MS, uh, of a PRISM program is this one, which 
computes the uh, value of the uh, blood type of a person on, on, um, on the basis of its genes. So, uh, the gene for the blood type of a person can take three forms, three alleles, so A, B, and O, okay? So, um, given the genes um, of a person, you can find out what is his blood type. So, given the genes of a person, the blood type of a person is deterministically de determined, okay? And uh, of the blood type gene, each person has two copies, one from, uh, from the predicate, for the chromosome inherited from the mother, and another one from the, on the chromosome inherited from the father. So, a person P, no, sorry, the blood type of a person, P, P is the blood type, not the person, depends on the genotype of the person, which is a couple, XY, which contains the alleles A, B, or O for each of the chromosomes, and is determined this way. <coughs> so the blood type, as you remember, of people are A, B, O, and A, B. And uh, is determined in this way. So this clause is deterministic. It says that if X and Y are equal, then the blood type is X. If uh, one of the genes is, is O, zero, really, the, uh, then the uh, blood type is Y, and similarly if, if Y is O. And otherwise, if they are different and uh, both different from, from zero, the blood type is AB. Here, the uh, probability lies in the values of the uh, alleles of the genes of the person. Okay, so the gene uh, is a switch, gene is a switch name, okay, with values A, B, and O. Okay, so Here you see an, an instance of the fact that PRISM has no memoing. Because here you have two uh, calls to the MSW uh, predicate for the same switch name. Okay. So in, um, in Problog and LPAD, if you have a clause like this, X and Y will, would also be always be the same. In PRISM, no, because each, calls, each call to MSW switch is independent from the other ones. There is no memoing. So when you call MSW, you sample a value for the gene switch, you unify with X, and when you call again with the same switch name, you don't return necessarily the same value. You can return another one. So with this program, you want to perform learning in this way. So you observe the blood type of people, okay, of many people, uh, and you want to infer the parameters, the distribution of genes uh, in, uh, of the allele of, G, of the blood type gene in, uh, in people. So for example, you uh, can call the learned predicate of the PRISM system where you provide Data, in this case, you say that in your uh, sample, you observe 40 times blood type A, 20 times blood type B, 30 times blood type 0, and 10 times blood types AB. And you want to infer the values of the, the distribution of the genes in the um, chromosome of people. So, this learn predicate does exactly that, and then you can see the values of the parameters by calling the cool goals show switch, and you will see that it has inferred a probability distribution over the allele A, B, and zero for people. So in this case, you have a population of individuals. You know the blood type of each individual, what you don't know is the probability distribution of gene, of the alleles of the gene for the blood type 
in people. With this uh, call, you can find out the distribution of the allele for the blood type gene. So PRISM looks for the maximum likelihood parameters, the parameters that, get that or it give rise to the maximum likelihood of the examples. What you observe, the data set are uh, the examples, but you don't observe the values of the MSW atoms, okay? So uh, since each MSW atom is, uh, can be associated to a random variable, these random variables are unobserved. You don't observe them in the data. When you, when you want to learn the parameters of a Bayesian network or a graphical model, uh, uh, if uh, you have a complete data set where you observe the values of all the random variables, you can compute the parameters of the conditional probability distribution by relative frequency. If you want to compute the probability that variable A assumes value true, given that variable B assumes value false, you count in the data how often A true and B false occur, and you, uh, you divide this number by the number of times uh, value, uh, variable B is false, and, and you get the parameter the value to be to insert in the conditional probability table. In this case, however, the, the random variables, which are the MSWs, which are not observed, so you have to use a different technique, which is an algorithm called expectation maximization, where you find out the value of the parameters by an iterative algorithm, where you start with the parameters initialized randomly, you compute the expectation, which means that you compute the probability distribution over the unseen variables given the seen ones, and you use this distribution as counts to compute the new values of the parameter using relative frequency, where in the relative frequency form, instead of using counts, you use the expected count, so the probabilistic count, and you repeat this loop until the log likelihood does not improve anymore. And this is a famous algorithm, and uh, uh, it was proved to always improve the likelihood. So at every iteration, the likelihood improves, so it gets higher, so it gets less negative, really. And um, this algorithm, however, is uh, guaranteed to find only a local maximum. So you're not guaranteed to find a global maximum. What you do is uh, you perform learning many times, starting from different randomly initialized parameters, and then you pick the result with the highest likelihood. So this is the algorithm. So you associate a random variable xi with values xi1, xi, and i. So this are the values of the switch. The switch is MSWIX, and the I is the ground switch name. So for each ground switch name, you have a random variable, and its, its domain is the, the values that the X can take. So first you compute the expected value of the count for the switch name I and the value K. You do this for all examples, for all switch names, and for all values that the switch can take. So this quantity, the expected value of the count, is the probability that the random variable xi uh, takes value k, xik, given the example. So the example is the observed, uh, what you observe. You don't know the value of xi, so you cannot count uh, the values of xi, what you do is you compute the probability distribution of xi, given the example, and you use this as the count of uh, variable xi, value k, for example, e. <coughs> then in the maximization uh, step, you use a relative frequency, so you sum uh, 
you sum the times value variable xi takes value xik for all the examples divided by the sum for all examples of all possible value of the variable xik. The difference is this is a relative frequency formula where the, instead of the counts, you have the expected counts. So you do, you must do this for all the examples. And uh, at the denominator, you have the sum for all examples and for all values of the variable. And um, since in prison program satisfies the exclusive or assumption, this conditional probability can be computed uh, using the definition of conditional probability. So it's the fraction of the joint probability of xi taking value xik and the example over the probability of the example. So we have seen the formula for the probability of, of the example. This one. So the probability of the example is the sum of the probability of all the explanation for the example. The explanation are conjunction of uh, uh, MSW atoms. So here to uh, want to compute the, pro the joint probability of the example given that the MSW atom with index i takes a particular value. So you can pick each explanation and discard all those that do not, do not contain MSW XIK. So you keep on the, the explanation kappa that contain, this should be kappa, not E, that contain the atom MSWI XIK. And you sum the probability of this explanation. So this, so basically you keep only the explanation where the atom MSWI XIK with MSWI with value K is present because otherwise they will not contribute to the joint probability. So you, uh, you compute this conditional probability in this way, so you have a, a, a way to compute the expected count. You have to find all the explanation for each example and uh, compute this conditional probability in, uh, um, for each switch, for each value of the switch, and for each example. So, um, a naive version of PRISM is this one, where you, uh, you are given a set of example, a program and a parameter epsilon. You start with uh, a log likelihood, which is minus infinity, and you re perform a cycle where you, uh, first you say the log likelihood to, val to variable LL0, and then for each switch name, for each value of uh, the, the switch, you compute the expected count with the formula uh, shown before. And then this is the expectation step, and this is the maximization step. You compute the new values, the parameters, by relative frequency, where the counts are replaced by the expected count. In the end, you compute the new value of the log likelihood, and you compare it with the previous value. If the difference is below a threshold, which is user defined, means that the algorithm has converged, and you stop, and you return the log likelihood and the parameters. <coughs> the problem with this algorithm is that there can be an exponential number of explanations. Think about the uh, HMM example, OK? In this case, we have uh, uh, three, three time points, uh, two possible states for each time point. The number of explanation is two to the power of three, okay? If the output sequence is, is uh, of length n, the number of explanation is two to the power of n. So as the output sequence increases, the number of explanation increases exponentially. Is this necessary? Actually, no, there is a way to uh, 
um, to build explanations so that uh, they don't explode. And we do so with a dynamic programming algorithm. Instead of building explanations which are sets of uh, MSW atom, you build formulas of the form GI, which GI is a goal of the program, if and only if a disjunction, where these disjunct are not sets of conjunction of MSW atom only, are uh, conjunction of atoms which can be MSW or can be other goals, okay? So if you manage to do this for every goal of the program so that the, this formula form a chain and so there, is, there are no cycles, so uh, the, your query, which is the example, is G1 and uh, each uh, SIJ contains only MSW and sub goal from the following goals. So if you can write this, a set of this formula, one for each goal, and each goal is dependent on uh, only f the following goals, you can, you can have a, a structure which is not cyclic and which can be used to compute the probability of the query. You can just uh, evaluate all this formula bottom up because the last goal, GM, does not depend on any other goal, so you can evaluate this probability. Once you evaluate that, you can evaluate the probability of the previous goal and so on up to G1, which is the original goal. In this case, uh, the number of formulas is linear rather than exponential for the Eden Marco model example. I'll, I'll show this in a, in a minute. And uh, so, this is possible if a condition uh, applies, which is called a, a, a cyclic support condition. Each goal is supported by a set of goals that uh, is a, a cyclic. A cyclic. Each, no goal depends on itself. And this is true if the prism uh, inference algorithm, which is based on tabling, uh, terminates. So basically, PRISM evaluates the goal using tabling. Tabling is a logic programming technique that um, memorizes uh, um, intermediate goals and their answers. So that if a goal is uh, encountered again, the answers are retrieved from the table rather than recomputed. This simple idea has important implication because it can avoid non-termination for many programs and can improve the efficiency uh, significantly. So, tabling does not, uh, avoids, does not avoid all type of loops. It, the program can still go into a loop, but is more difficult. And if tabling terminates, then tabling has built a, a, a set of this expression that is a cyclic. For the, the, our previous query, PRISM build these formulas. So the query depends on the atom HMMS1 ABB. HMMS1 ABB depends on MSW, which is abbreviated with them as out as 1A, MSW transition S1 S1, and the atom HMM S1 A, S, S1 BB, or it depends on this other um, set of atoms. So, uh, as you can see, this predicate depends on uh, the system moving from state one to state one, or from state one to state two, and then from what happens afterwards, okay? Again, here, you have to write the uh, equation defining HMMS1BB and HMMS2BB, which are appear here and here. 
And at time two, from state one, it can remain in state one or go to state two. At time two, if it was in state S2, it can go to state one or remain in state two, and so on. So, for each time point, uh, these kind of goals have two, two explanations, okay, depending on what is the next state. For each uh, time point, you have two goals of this form, each with two explanations, but if the, uh, uh, the, the output sequence is of length n, you will have uh, two n goals like this, each with two explanations. So the number of formulas that they are built to answer a query like this is linear instead of exponential. This is as important implication. If the output sequence is very long, with this algorithm, you manage to answer in a reasonable time. OK, but the problem is that how do you compute the expected count now, in this case? OK, let's reason like this. Um, consider your example E and your set of explanation for it KE. Explanations like uh, of this form, not, uh, not including goals in the explanation, OK? So, you can divide the set of explanation in two sets, given an MSSW uh, predicate, switch name I. Those that contain the atom MSW I X K, which are called K, K E1, and those that do not contain it. So the probability of the example is the sum of the probability of two, these two sets of explanation, but the probability of a variable xi taking value xi k and the example is only the probability of the first set of explanation. Okay? Each explanation in uh, this set takes this form uh, GI, where GI is the MSW I XK, and uh, other MSW switches, and so on. It's a set of conjunctions, each containing the goal GI, which is the MSW. So, uh, the probability of explanation KE1 is the sum of, uh, for all these uh, sets, of the probability of this conjunction, GI W1. WI. So the probability of GI times the probability of W. So you can uh, put GI outside and compute the sum of this uh, conjunction W. So suppose GI is our MSWI uh, XK uh, atom. The, the joint probability is obtained from the formula above. This is the formula from here, okay? This is the formula from before. And this, this uh, formula can be seen as the partial derivative of the probability of uh, the set of explanation key E with respect to atom GI, which is the MSW atom. Why? Because the probability, the, the derivative of KE2 is zero because it does not contain the, the, the switch uh, atom. The probability of uh, KE1 is uh, this one. And if you uh, compute the derivative with respect to GI, you simply delete this factor and you get this formula. So the, the joint probability of uh, xi taking value k, for example, e, is uh, 
the, the, the partial derivative of the set of explanation for example E over the goal with respect to the goal. So this is the, also the probability of the example. So if we call this partial derivative of the probability of the example with respect atom G i, a quantity Q uh, of atom G i, we, we get this uh, formula. And if the goal G i is a, a MSW switch, then the probability of G i is given by the parameters associated to value K of uh, the switch. So now we have to compute this partial derivative And um, these quantities, QGI and PGI, have names. They are called inside probability, PGI, and outside probability, QGI. Why? Because uh, it turns out that PRISM generalizes the inside-out algorithm for probabilistic context-free grammar. And uh, it also generalizes the forward-backward algorithm for learning in HMM by the uh, bound welch algorithm. So, to compute the inside probability, we have to evaluate the uh, explanation graph uh, bottom up. So, first of all, we assign the probability of each MSW atom to the parameters that are given in the program. Then you um, evaluate each goal from GM to G1 bottom up, you first set the probability of goal G1 to zero, and then you, uh, you cycle over the explanation for GI, and uh, each explanation as IJ is a conjunction of uh, uh, atoms, and uh, the probability of each atom, these atoms are either MSW switches, for which you know the probability, or G, uh, atoms G, GL, with L greater than I, so you have already computed their probability, so you can compute the probability of each individual explanation for GI, and you sum up the contribution of explanation to the probability of GI. So this is a, an evaluation. This set of form is also called an explanation graph because it forms a, 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 a graph of dependency. And with this algorithm, you compute the probability of each intermediate atom and of the example in the end. Let us see outside probabilities. So outside probabilities for a goal GI are defined as the uh, partial derivative of the probability of the example over the probability of the goal GI. Suppose GI occurs in the ground program, so in the explanation graph in these formulas. So you have a clause uh, where atom B1 depends on GI and a conjunction W11 and you have other clauses for atom B1, and then you have other atoms, B2, B, B3, and so on, up to BK, that have atom G1, GI, in the body, together with other atoms. This, this is an instantiation of the ground program, okay? Given this ground program, you can compute the probability of B1 by uh, compute the probability of each individual body and summing out the probability uh, altogether. This is because of the exclusive or assumption. So body, uh, different clauses for the same atom are mutually exclusive, so you can sum up the probability. You do this for all uh, atoms BK. Okay, now that you have this ground program written down, we start to compute the outside probability. So, for the, uh, if GI is the example E, so if GI is G1, so the QG1 is 1, as E is equal to G1, so the, the partial derivative of this probability with respect to itself is 1. For the other values of I, 
we compute QGI with the chain rule of uh, derivation of um, the derivative, knowing that P of E is a function of the probability of each atom B1, B2, BK. So the chain rule states that the, the partial derivative of a, a function with respect to a, a variable uh, is given by the sum of the partial derivative of all the uh, uh, intermediate variables. So you compute the partial derivative of the probability of the query given uh, with respect to B1 times the partial derivative of the probability of B1 with respect to the probability of G1. You do this for all bi, b1, b2, bk, okay, okay, so now you replace the probability of b1 with the formula here. This is, the probability of b1 is a sum, so you compute the derivative of each individual uh, term, okay, and you do this for all bi, b1, b2, up to bk, okay, uh, then you, you, uh, this probability is uh, the outside probability of b1, and this partial derivative uh, is the probability of the conjunction over the probability of GI, if G, GI, so, um, this uh, um, partial derivative, the only, um, so this, the, 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 should be GI, not G1, okay, it should be I. So, of this sum, the, the, the partial derivative, here you have GI here and here. This is a multiplication of a term that contains GI times a term that does not contain the probability of GI. So uh, you, uh, uh, the probability is simply the probability of W11, which you can obtain by dividing the joint probability of GI and W11 over the probability of GI. This, this one is a an inside probability is computed by this algorithm. And this one is, uh, uh, is known because it is computed as well by the, uh, as an inside probability. So you can compute this outside probability with a recursive formula. QG1 is 1 and QGI is QB1, where B1 is one of the atoms where GI appears in the body. Here you have to sum for all the bodies of uh, B1, uh, where you divide the probability of the body over the probability of GI, and you do this for all B, 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 J, B1, B2, up to BK, okay? So, um, this B1 are for goals that uh, precede GI in the explanation graph. So, you can evaluate this formula top-down from G1 to G2 to G3 up to GM because this BK uh, proceed GI. So you have, you have this algorithm for computing outside probabilities that uh, cycles over the goals from the top to the bottom, from 2 to M, and uh, it sets the initial value of the outside probability to zero and then performs a cycle over the uh, clauses that uh, have GI uh, over the explanation of GI. This, uh, each explanation is a conjunction on atom, and for each of this atom, we update its uh, outside probability by 
summing the contribution of gold GI of using the formula, the recursive formula here. So this is an example of a dynamic programming algorithm. You, you solve a problem by recursively decomposing the problem in a smaller problem. In this case, you uh, consider the explanation graph uh, one level at a time and you, uh, you visit the graph twice. Once bottom-up to compute inside probability, the probability of atoms, and uh, another one top-down to compute the partial derivative of the probability of the example given the probability of the goal, which uh, gives uh, the expected, which allows you to compute the expected count. So, the re yes. Uh, I, as, as I was, uh, if you don't use this programming trick and you want to learn um, the parameters of this program, for example, you get an exponential complexity. So, um, with the with dynamic programming trick, you get down to a linear complexity. So, Yes, yes. She, uh, I don't know if it is possible in prison, but conceptually, yes, of course. Yeah. That's a solution. What you can do is um, uh, you can also limit the depth of explanation. And this is useful when uh, you have uh, a program that may not terminate. If you have a program that may go into a loop, but you limit the depth of explanation, you always terminate, but you get an approximation of the probability. So this is uh, the uh, non-naive algorithm. You first compute the expectation and then perform maximization by uh, summing out the, uh, by summing by relative frequency. And the expectation are computed by calling by computing inside probability and outside probability, and then by uh, updating the expected count. So the authors of PRISM proved that uh, the PRISM learning algorithm has the same time complexity for the case of a program encoding a needle marker model as the specific parameter learning algorithm, the same for you can encode the probabilistic context-free grammar in PRISM, and if you apply PRISM parameter learning algorithm, you get the same complexity of the inside-out algorithm that is specific for probabilistic context-free grammar. This is a very attractive property. So what, you, what we have is that the complexity of this general algorithm that can handle uh, any program is the same for the case of uh, programs encoding specific model of the specific special algorithm. Okay, so uh, this concludes the treatment of PRISM, and now let's consider parameter learning for programs that do not respect the assumption of PRISM. So where you have to solve this giant, this giant, this joint sum problem. So the first, uh, again, you have to use expectation maximization. The first algorithm uh, for uh, EM for a language similar to LPAD, which was called CPTL, was proposed in 2008. And this, CIP, this language is a simplified version of LPAD that is, uh, that takes into account time. And uh, again, this, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, the counts were computed using binary decision diagram. If you remember from yesterday, binary decision diagram are uh, circuits which are useful for computing the probability of queries, okay? And, uh, uh, you can exploit BDDs for 
computing the required expectations, okay? With a dynamic programming algorithm, again, which is similar to PRISM, but uh, slightly different. So, uh, then uh, uh, Ishiata and others independently proposed a similar algorithm, probably the times were, were right for this uh, result. Then um, the group of Leuven developed LFI Problog, Learning from Interpretation Problog, which applied EM for Problog over BDDs because uh, at, the, at that time they were used by Problog. And then here in Ferraro we developed a version again of uh, EM learning for LPATs using BDDs uh, that is very similar to the, to the other one. So let's consider this uh, algorithm emblem that we developed in Ferrara. It's a parameter learning algorithm for LPAD. So you are given a program P, an LPAD, that has unknown parameters, and you are given two sets of examples, a set of positive examples and a set of negative examples, which are ground atoms, okay? You want to find the parameters of the program that maximize the likelihood of the example, where for positive example, you want to maximize the probability of the example. For negative example, you want to maximize the probability of the negation of the example, which is equivalent to one minus the probability of the examples. These examples are built for predicates that are called target because they are the ones for which you want to improve the classification performance. You want to better predict their truth value. And uh, typically, uh, the LPAD that uh, you want to use to, for learning the parameters has two components. A set of rules annotated with parameters that are those that you want to learn. And also, you are given a set of ground facts which are certain, that represent background knowledge, and that describe individual cases, individual uh, entities of the domain. Um, usually, you may want to provide uh, more than one set of uh, info, uh, information on individual cases. So you may have more than one word in a way. So uh, you can, for example, if you are learning uh, from data from a social network, you may have uh, uh, data for regarding a social network, and you may have data regarding other social network, a second, a third, and you can use all this data together, simply each uh, description of a social network will be a mega interpretation or a mega example. We contain, a, we'll describe a set of individuals, okay? And you want to apply the program to each word. Um, so for example, take the advice by uh, problem. You may have uh, information about the social network of the, the, the Department of Computer Science of the University of Washington. In that case, uh, and the examples there for the advice by predicate are the advice by atoms grounded with specific person. You have more than one. Then you may have the social network of Department of Computer Science of the University of Stanford. And then again, you have other examples together with data about the example that is separate from the previous one. So you have mega interpretation. Make example. Inside this make example, you have the individual examples, and uh, they are this, the, the examples are described so that it's possible to distinguish positive from negative examples. So you want to maximize the product of the likelihood for every example of every make interpretation. So I think uh, it's time to 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 stop. Uh, so that we can start afterwards with uh, with that example. Okay. <laughs>